For those who don't know, just give us a short history of where problems with anti-Israel bias first appeared at the UN and how they've kind of manifested themselves and got more serious. Well, uh, just a, a bit of history. The United Nations, uh, shortly after its founding in 1947, 29th of November, made the historic vote to, to support a Jewish state and an Arab state in what was then British Mandatory Palestine. The Jews danced in the streets in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. The Arabs declared war. They did not want their independent state if it meant that there would be a Jewish state anywhere, even though the Jewish state that was on offer at the time uh, included none of the historic uh, biblical heartland did not include Jerusalem, the site of the ancient temple, the Western Wall, did not include Hebron, where uh, King David uh, uh, ruled and where the patriarchs are buried. Uh, but that even a sliver of land was uh, cause for war, and the Arabs went to war. So that in the early years, the United Nations supported the idea of a Jewish state. But if you fast forward beginning, I'd say the early 60s, you have the emergence of the so-called non-aligned movement, where third world countries prodded by the Soviet Union, uh, using the anti-colonial spirit against Western countries, the Soviet Union exploited that together with the Arab states to begin to turn countries against Israel. So as, as more and more former colonial countries influenced by the Soviet Union joined the UN in the 1960s, you began to have more and more one-sided resolutions condemning Israel, supporting terrorism implicitly or sometimes even explicitly by saying all available means are legitimate to attack Israel. And most infamously, 1975, the UN General Assembly, the same General Assembly that voted for a Jewish state in 1947, so less than 30 years later, declared that Zionism is a form of racism. So Jewish nationalism, the idea that the Jews are entitled to have their own homeland and their ancient ancestral homeland, that was deemed racist by the United Nations General Assembly. So really it began from there, and they began to institute a whole infrastructure of anti-Israel demonization, a series of committees based in New York that investigate Israel. They're made up of anti-Israel countries like Iran, Libya, Syria, uh, annual resolutions. Every year at the General Assembly, we have one on one resolution on North Korea, one on Syria, one on Iran, and 15 on Israel. So there are more resolutions on Israel than the rest of the world combined. That's every year. Here in Geneva at the UN Human Rights Council, every meeting, we're in a, a, one of the uh, annual sessions now, every meeting has one agenda item one day on the world and one agenda item one day on Israel alone. So these are just some examples of the built-in institutional scapegoating and demonization of the Jewish state at the United Nations. And it certainly feels that since the October 7th terror massacres perpetrated by Hamas, that rather than supporting Israel's right to defend itself, the UN has doubled down on its criticism. How disappointing and frustrating and outrageous is that? Look, it, it's hard to believe that we weren't already at the bottom of the barrel for you know all the things that I just described and I could have gone on for another hour in terms of how Israel is singled out in various UN bodies. And yet, and yet, since October 7th, they've managed to go even lower. Meaning, the head of the World Health Organization himself, Dr. Tedros, didn't in the past focus a lot on Israel, even though the annual World Health Assembly would pass a resolution by the Arab states singling out Israel. But the head of the World Health Organization, the heads of other organizations, we're not so invested in singling out Israel, but since then, it's no holds barred. You have Dr. Tedros and the World Health Organization condemning Israel for violating the sanctity of hospitals when Hamas uh, routinely subverts the sanctity of hospitals by putting in hundreds of Islamic Jihad and Hamas fighters in the Shifa hospital and all the others. And they say it, and you, you can see it, and you have doctors, Western doctors who served in these hospitals who will say, we knew that in the basement there were Hamas people there, but you weren't allowed to talk about it. And everyone would say something in hushed tones and everybody knew. So everybody knows, but the WHO, part of the UN, will never condemn Hamas for what they're doing. and will condemn Israel for you know um, pulling out hundreds of terrorists out of Shifa hospitals. So Israel gets condemned for removing the terrorists from a hospital, even though this past week, Israel, I think, killed, I don't know the exact numbers, 
maybe killed 100 terrorists, maybe arrested 500 more, and there were zero civilian casualties. So the normal thing for the World Health Organization would be, we condemn the terrorist group Hamas for sub putting patients in danger and subverting hospitals by, by you know, violating the Geneva Conventions and sending in terrorists into the hospitals. We commend Israel for an operation that removed the terrorists and didn't kill any civilians. It's extraordinary. That's not what we're seeing. The same, the head of the UN Secretariat, Mr. Guterres, you know, once in a while he will condemn Hamas, but infamously he adds, but, but he says, these attacks of Hamas did not happen in a vacuum. And then he goes on to enumerate numerous so-called grievances of the Palestinians effectively justifying the Hamas terrorist attacks. He said afterwards, no, I didn't justify it. That is false. He did justify. He did justify. And, you know, just yesterday, you know, talk about disappointment. I was at the Human Rights Council and the, you know, virulent anti-Semite Francesca Albanese. And when I say anti-Semite, I don't use that word um, flippantly. This is someone who 10 years ago in July 2014 wrote on Facebook that America is subjugated by the Jewish lobby. America is subjugated by the Jewish lobby. She told a Hamas conference about two years ago, you have the right to resist. I mean, she is an openly virulent anti-Semite, has been accusing Israel of genocide for 10 years, saying that Israel is carrying out a Holocaust against the Palestinians. And yesterday she had the temerity to present a report saying, I've carefully examined and after very careful methodical analysis, I've concluded Israel is committing genocide in Gaza. Uh, well, she's been saying this for 10 years. And, and of course, the opposite is true. The Hamas people who massacred more than a thousand Israelis, injured thousands more, raped, tortured, mutilated, they carried out genocide and what they wanted to do of a part of the Jewish people. And if they could, they would do the rest to the rest of the Jewish people. So she, it's, we're talking about Orwellian inversion at the world's highest human rights body. She was appointed, no one objected. Two years ago, we went to the Human Rights Council. We told them exactly who she was, no country, None of the Western countries, including America, said a thing. They were all, didn't want to break consensus, and they appointed a virulent anti-Semite. But I give credit to France, Germany, and the U.S. in the past few weeks when she said that uh, she confronted Macron. Macron said that, uh, correctly, that Hamas, uh, the massacre, was the greatest massacre of Jews since the Holocaust, the greatest anti-Semitic massacre. She said, not true. She wrote on Twitter, not true. She said, nothing to do with Jews. She said... Uh, the the events of October 7th were, quote, a response to Israel's oppression. So she justifies the most vile terrorist attacks. And to their credit, France condemned her, Germany condemned her, America condemned her. I wish they had done it two years ago when she was appointed, but at least they're doing it now. You made reference there to Hamas using rape as a weapon of war and arguably one of the most appalling abuses by the UN since October 7th has been the fact that they had to be shamed and shamed and shamed again before they would accept any testimony that Israeli women had been subjected to sexual violence. Look, there's a UN agency called UN Women. They say they're the world's leading agency for gender equality and the rights of women. This agency for months said not a word about uh, an assault that was planned orchestrated assault against women, sexual assault of women by Hamas. They did comment on the war, but almost all of their uh, posts were uh, criticizing Israel implicitly or explicitly. And the issue that they're charged with addressing women's rights, protection of women, protection against rape, they were silent. Indeed, as you said, they had to be shamed. Even when they said something, they said, ah, well, but there's two sides and one side and another side. And look, we, we know who's in UN Women. We exposed one of their leading officials. I think she's the Deputy Chief of International Peace and Security, Sarah Douglas, an American woman. She posted on her uh, Twitter account no less than 153 endorsements in the months of, I think, October, November, and December, endorsements of radical posts condemning Israel for genocide. She endorsed, she clicked like on uh, posts by radical groups like If Not Now and other groups in America that were shutting down bridges and streets to condemn Israel for, quote, genocide. She was liking posts by the squad, the radical left AOC and Rashida Tlaib and Cori Bush. She She's a UN official sworn on an oath of neutrality 
endorsing the most radical anti-Israel posts. She didn't endorse a single post condemning Hamas. And she's the deputy chief of UN Women's Peace and Security. We exposed it. The UN said they admitted that she, it was a violation of the code of conduct. They said they'd look into it months later. You know, this happened around Christmas time. We're now several months later. I haven't heard a thing about Sarah Douglas. I haven't heard that she's been suspended or fired. So the message at the UN is that whether it's UN Women or any other agency, uh, it's no holds barred. You can do whatever you want against Israel. It could be breaching UN rules. You know, UN employees who are Jewish or Israeli feel uh, horrible. They they describe in a recent uh, news report from JNS how they feel targeted uh, at their workplace. The UN's not doing a thing, and and UN staff again have the sense apparently, or I've been given the impression that they have carte blanche to just violate any UN rules of neutrality, which are quite strict. You will not find a UN official condemning China's, you know, imprisonment of a million Muslim Uyghurs. You will not find a UN official condemning Russia for bombing to death thousands of Ukrainians or barrel bombing hospitals in Syria. They will be very hesitant. But on Israel, the opposite is the case. They feel that nothing will happen to them and apparently nothing will happen to them. And then you get to UNRWA. Just outline the allegations against UNRWA and its suspected involvement in the October 7th massacres. So just a, a word on what UNRWA is, you know, next to our office in Geneva is the UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency, which deals with millions of refugees around the world from Sudan, from Syria, from Ukraine. And their job is to resettle them, to find homes elsewhere. Uh, they don't always succeed, but that's their goal. And obviously, there are millions of refugees who are taken in in Germany, Sweden, uh, Canada, and other countries. UNRWA is the opposite. UNRWA is dedicated only for the Palestinians. It was created initially with good intentions after it was actually created before UNHCR, around 1949-1950, by American initiative to help Palestinians who were uh, refugees from the War of 1948. But unlike UNHCR, UNRWA refuses to resettle one of them. So the, the, the Palestinian refugees themselves and the Arab host states in Lebanon, Jordan, Gaza, and the West Bank, they refuse to be resettled. They said, no, no, we refuse to accept a Jewish state. We need to go home to Israel, so to speak, and to undo Israel, the so-called right of return. So the very idea of UNRWA is completely the opposite of a two-state solution. That is why children in Gaza are taught your home is not here in Gaza. Your home is over there in Israel. And so when they get cement, what do you think they do with the cement? They don't build like in Dubai up high and build towards the future. They build down below terror tunnels, hundreds and hundreds of miles of terror tunnels, tunneling into Israel, which they used on October 7th to invade and kill and massacre, to exercise what UNRWA tells them is their right of return. So that's the whole essence of UNRWA is subversive. We discovered in the past few months more than a dozen UNRWA employees took part in the massacre of October 7th, including one UNRWA worker who kidnapped the lifeless body of Yonatan Samarano and dragged him into Gaza. We know that 450 UNRWA employees in Gaza belong to Hamas and Islamic Jihad. We exposed that 3,000 UNRWA teachers belong to a Telegram chat group that celebrated the atrocities of October 7th. And we know that, you know, when a UNRWA official is suspended for being part of Hamas, the entire UNRWA staff union in Gaza, 8,000 teachers and school principals, went into the streets to protest that he should, a UNRWA staff union leader should be allowed to be a Hamas terrorist leader. So when, when UNRWA's defenders like Philippe Lazzarini, the commissioner general, and their apologists in the West, people like Owen Jones, AOC, Ken Roth, Amnesty International, Senator Chris Van Hollen in America, when they say, oh, it's just a few bad apples, a few bad apples, 450 UNRWA employees are terrorists. 3,000 belong to a chat group that embraced the atrocities. 8,000 UNRWA teachers and school principals in Gaza protested on the streets, rallying for Su'el al-Hindi, a member of the Hamas Politburo. It's not a few bad apples. The entire UNRWA agency is subverted. It's rotten to the core. And then, of course... And I imagine you can be shocked but unsurprised at the same time we had the ceasefire UN vote the other day. What's your reaction to that? And where do you think it goes from here? Look, what we need is unconditional release of the hostages. 
Uh, let us not forget that Hamas has 130 hostages. These people are being tortured, sexually assaulted, humiliated, starved. And Hamas could end the war right now by releasing the hostages and surrendering. They refuse to do so. And there are, I would say, useful idiots in the West who are basically supporting Hamas. And, you know, they say, well, the war has to end here. It's like putting out 80% of a fire and leaving the 20% of the fire. Your house will be destroyed. If Israel allows Hamas to maintain its stronghold in, in Rafah, they will um, rebuild and they will, as they promised, uh, commit October 7th atrocities again and again. Israel cannot allow itself to do that. The ceasefire resolution was immoral because it did not call for an unconditional release of the hostages. Uh, it said um, it, 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 it said that prisoners should be released uh, without tying it to the hostages. So it wants Israel to release Hamas prisoners without Hamas necessarily releasing the hostages, which is obscene. The prisoners that Israel is holding are hundreds of Hamas terrorists with blood on their hands. So uh, the, the resolution didn't condemn Hamas. It didn't uh, condition the uh, ceasefire on release of the hostages. And in that sense, it was a reward for Hamas. Hamas praised it. So any any Western ambassador, any Western government that could support a resolution that was welcomed and embraced by Hamas, I think they have some serious moral questions they should be asking themselves.